listening to The Justin Herman Show, where every episode he has conversations with interesting people. Here is your host, Justin Herman. Well, hey, everybody. How is it going? Really excited for the guest we have today. His name is Ted Vaughn. He is just a really smart guy. He has an agency called Historic Agency that you're going to hear a little bit about. Um, He's really a fun, generous guy. And I went down to his beautiful house in San Diego, got to sit and have a great conversation. If you ever met Ted before, then you kind of have an idea of his abilities and skills. Um, He's helped rebrand, create clarity for messaging. He has uh, leadership. He has um, design. He has marketing. He has pretty much any creative tool in his tool belt. And he helps churches and organizations and not-for-profits. Uh, I heard him first speak uh, at Mariners back in the day, and we just stayed in touch. Really good guy. Um, I think you're going to love this conversation. Very basic. Get to know you. If you don't know Ted, you're going to be you know you're going to get to know him now, obviously. Um, but uh, but he's just a nice guy. I hope you enjoy um, tuning in to this conversation um, with a really really interesting guy, my friend Ted Vaughn. Let's get started. <laughs> Well, here we are with Ted. How's it going, man? I'm happy to be here. We we've had a few hurdles to schedule this thing, so thank you for you know that you're and I'm I'm great thankful you said that. Very gracious. Okay. You, you know, it really, I always find it funny when people get all uptight about schedule stuff. I guess I feel like, bad. Do you really? I do. I don't feel bad at all. Really? Yeah, I don't feel bad when it <laughs> happens to me, and I don't, also don't feel bad when it happens because you know it, it's like it's good to know real life happens. Yeah, just is what everyone's got to be easy going about it. But you know the the goal of my you know cur- you know the whole podcasting deal is flexibility. Yeah, I mean if you can't be flexible with people, you'll ne- you're never going to get them. You know yeah, what I mean? yeah. You know I probably need to be more flexible. Ironically, I don't like people to impose boundaries on me, but I feel very um, I'm a punctual guy. So when there is a time or a date, and then it things change it kind of bugs me so i feel bad about that but it's probably my own stuff no that's pretty good i my wife is that way she's really like like if it's if it's 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 on the schedule it's happening yeah and it's not on the schedule then it isn't happening and i'm probably maybe a more Mm loosey-goosey because it's like i know i know some things are happening kind of and i just forget to add them to the calendar and but you know, then, then things come up, emergencies come up, life comes up. We're such complex creatures. There's so many things from story of origin, hard wiring, yeah. muscle memory from things you've learned. You know, gosh, I'm constantly trying to figure myself out. And the harder I try, the deeper the pool gets. And it's like, yeah, forget it. <laughs> so where did you where did you grow up? Did you grow up in California? Yeah, uh-huh. I'm a SoCal kid, uh, born and raised in uh, Orange County, California, for the most part. Um, Thought for a while I would live in Dallas or Nashville. I was really into music and um, just never could quite get there. I remember thinking in Nashville, I could drive like 200 miles in any direction and never hit ocean. And it kind of freaked me out. Yeah. I don't know if I'd like that. It really like messed with my mind. So I realized I think I need to live near a large body of water, like maybe like Michigan, but, mm. but something big enough to at least provide like a there. That, that is something. Yeah. North, south, east, west. But, so yeah, I, I've been born and raised here my whole life. My whole career has been out here. Um, you know, I have a company now in Arizona, but um, I don't want to live in Phoenix. Could you imagine? You know, it's so funny you say that. For I, all the people that live in Phoenix. Well, really I, not only, I can't imagine, but, but, and a lot of people don't know this who are listeners of the show, but my, uh, my wife, her in-laws are retiring to Arizona. They bought a house in Lake Havasu from from here. So what? they they live in Riverside, California. They have pretty much their whole, you know, the whole life. Yeah. And he owns a company. And he's just at the point where he's ready to kind of cash out and and sell. They have a huge house there. They're going to sell the house. They bought a house in Lake Havasu already, which is going to be like the new vacation home. Like they want to build like mm, memories that's there. That's cool cuz you yeah. know your dollars will go a lot further there. Well, so he's buying a second house there in Prescott. For ah, for them, my dad lived in Prescott, Arizona. Oh, or see, retired there. Yep, and then and now and they're dropping hints to us 
you know, Arizona, pretty great. You know, we can maybe get you a house out there. You know, the, and you know, it's so funny. It's going nuts out there. Gilbert, Arizona, which is where Historic Agency is, the company I helped start. Yeah. We're, um, you know, Gilbert's getting hipsterized. There's great food everywhere in Arizona. The food scene is nuts. I'm a yeah, total, total foodie. That's so much. Dude, yeah, it's great. Yeah, I mean, Arizona, there are worse places to be when it comes to culture, food. Arizona is definitely catching up. It's just so blazing hot. See, I couldn't deal with that unless we had a Six pool. Six months of the year. It would be a big deal. The Being in that kind of heat, I would hate. And I grew up in Buffalo, so like I know what it means to grow up in like oh. frigid cold. Yeah, my wife's from uh, upstate. We go to Rochester every oh, Christmas, dude, bro. I love Rochester. The Amherst, Rochester Amherst hockey team. Dude, sometimes so. we fly into Buffalo and drive, and then we'll hit a whiteout. And You're a very lucky man. Bro, <laughs> Buffalo. I love it there. <laughs> my wife hates it. She, she hates a strong word. I took her back there once. I mean, she's a California girl. Yeah. So I took her back there once to see, and only once, maybe twice actually. I think I took when we went back there twice, and now that you say she it, was not it. into I it. I hear it in your voice. I oh, hear yeah. the little upstate nasal thing. Yeah, yeah. So when I say like <laughs> words like apple yeah. and and you know you know car, That's hilarious. And, yeah, hit the A really hard. Yeah, and she she was just not was not for it. Was not for it. So you know Dude, we're, we're probably never super live funny. in New York. But extreme weather, like I lived that. Yeah. So yeah, extreme cold, it's like I don't want yeah. that. Extreme hot, it's like I don't know if I'm. Made for that either, unless we have a pool again. I mean, if I had to pick one, I think I'd pick cold. Really? You can ski and you can, like in the heat, it's just, it, that's like it wasn't meant for life. Okay, so you're mentioning one thing, though, that is good about snow. And I am fine with skiing know, and snowboarding. I'm not right, against that. Right, but right. I grew up shoveling snow. So you want to talk story <laughs> of origin or muscle memory, whatever that is. Uh, the, you know, growing up from age, you know, eight to 18, shoveling every winter. Knowing that totally while you're at it. school, yeah. the snow is just continuing to fall, and you, you, you know, two a days in New York is not football practice; it's it's shoveling the driveway. We went to a movie once around Christmas time and left the theater. It had been a massive blizzard, and we all the cars were buried. You could oh, yeah. see the antenna, but so the only way you could find the car was by clicking and hopefully seeing the lights under yeah. the snow. Yeah. yeah, we found it and buried unburied it. But oh, I couldn't imagine gosh. like that doing that for two months would be nuts. Yeah, doing it for 20 years is also nuts. It, I mean, it just, I just don't see myself wanting to do that again. But we're going out to Arizona. So I'm going out there for like mm -hmm. this month, actually. So this is, we're recording this in, November, in the very beginning of November. I'm going out there once for my buddy's Iron Man. Um, he's running it, and I'm surprising him there. Wow. And um, coming, I'm going to a conference. I'm coming back a day early from the conference to watch him run or like run and swim and bike but you only ever see him like a couple times because you only see him at transitions the rest of the time they're literally running a marathon and like well, biking yeah I mean, whole thing. Is, is it a full iron man it's a full iron man the full iron man. the full iron man and he's been he's been working out like up toward this it's like it's like a century a hundred mile bike ride it's a full marathon yeah. like a three mile swim is that yeah. right yeah good it's insane Lord. Man. And he's been working to, I mean, he's been working out toward it. He's doing it for his father. His father passed away. So, um, of cancer. So he's doing kind of like yeah, this thing in memory of him, which is familiar of people who do Iron Man's. Like they yeah. usually, they, if you don't have something motivating you to do that, I don't think you're going to, you're going to do it. I don't no think the, way. the, oh, I just want to be, a, be a badass is enough of a motivation to <laughs> yeah, finish. Yeah, do the, the mud, the mud run or whatever yeah, that so is. Yeah, well, I'll do a color run or something. I mean, I'm not going to, I don't know if I've got an Iron Man. <laughs> yeah, but, like a bourbon run I could do. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, and then me and my wife were going out there at the very, like right after Thanksgiving to just drive around Arizona to like look at potential places. So there's, there's a lot more like seriousness so to like a potential move to Arizona. Well, the gravitational pull is working. Well, you know, anytime you're in, well, for, so two, three, a couple things you don't know about me, I don't think. Um, I used to work at a church called Mariners. Which I, you think you do know that. Um, I left Mariners <laughs> after my mom passed away in 2017. 2017, she passed away. I left like very early 2018. Oh. And the reasons we left were um, not because we were unhappy at Mariners. Really happy at Mariners. Mar we we go to Mariners now. So when I first church. met you, I was at Mariners, and your mom had I think probably because you weren't there much longer. Yeah, you, yeah. She I, was she was near she was near in the end. I think you were transitioning when I met you. We just didn't. Uh, we did. I didn't know it until like the very end. She kind of hid it from me, which is wow. totally common um, in people who uh -huh. like you know the cancers went to her brain. They're like listen, there's no real yeah, hope here. No, no turning back. And she decided she didn't want to. You know, burden me with it, which a lot of you know, that's like a normal thing. 
um, somewhat normal thing. So when it all kind of f- happened the way it happened, it just was what it was. Wow. And me and my wife were like, well, what are we going to, you know, we probably took three or four months to like think about our life. And we came to some conclusions of what we wanted to do. And they go in this order. We wanted to live close to family so our kids could grow up with our grandparents. We wanted to own a house. Um, and we wanted to uh, you know, be closer to her work, which at the time she worked in Riverside. We lived in Irvine. So that's like, you know, an hour and a half each way without traffic. So it was a long drive. And we, we so we made the move to Riverside, lived close to her parents, got a house, close to work. And um, I don't think those things have changed. So like the, the move to Arizona, while probably really hot, there's a lot of reasons for it. Oh, that's great. So yeah, you have a true north. Yeah. And it's informing your decision making as a family. You guys are aligned. That's awesome. People are weird about that though. A lot of people don't but a lot of people like they're like, it's yeah, it's awesome. But like I don't know if like I don't know if that's for me. Like I don't know if I would do that. Or like they're like, that's awesome, but like what about your career? Like what about your career? The thing, you know, what about the things you yeah. really want to do? Well, you're putting family on a higher threshold than I think most people do. Um, especially in today's world, I just don't see much of that anymore. It, I mean, I think that was less unusual two, three, four decades ago. I think it's un, it seems unusual to me today. Yeah. Um, and I don't know why that is. Maybe it's more broken homes. You know, I was raised in a broken home, only child. Um, for me, the idea of family, it was never anything of too much substantive value, you know, so I've kind of lived my life as a bit of a, a bit of a loner when it comes to family. There's no real strong tether. My wife's family, she comes from, as you you know, Rochester, New York. Yeah, yeah. Big family, a lot of siblings still get together every Christmas or more often mm-hmm. if they can. Most of them still live there. And, you know, that, that's a huge compass for her. And I've been able to see that and appreciate that and glom onto that. But, um, but, but I just, I don't have it myself. You know, I grew up in a, in a broken home as well. It's just so me and you have so much in common. <laughs> um, the, you have more tattoos. I do have a few more tattoos. Um, you should, I mean, you can always get tattoos, by the way. There's no, yes. there's no stopping you. Um, the, uh, but the thing I find to be so interesting is that uh, my mom was as close we, as we were in Buffalo, she was like kicking my butt out the door to like figure out life. Like she did not want me to like just stay in Buffalo mm-hmm. and, um, you know, work some job just so like I could be close. Mm. And I'm not knocking whoever does that, of course. But she was like, I want you to go to college. And you she know, wanted more. Yeah. She, she wanted me to go, you know, really figure it out because she, th- she thought I was capable. Oh, and great. so she kicked me out to college in Missouri. And then, you know, when I was like, oh, I think I'm going to California. She's like, you should do it. Take the, take the job. Like, you know, you can do it. Make it happen. And she. Good for your mom. That's yeah, great to hear. Yeah. She was really great. That's awesome. She was really great. Um, but man, oh man, it was, uh, your know, family is such a tough thing. Family is such a, such a tough thing. Especially having kids now, it's like, you know, now I have a whole nother level of things yeah. that I never thought I would care about or like worry about. Like when I'm like in my twenties and just killing it or even as a newlywed, then when you have kids, it changes everything. Yeah. I remember thinking, you know, when you uh, get married, that's really the first step towards realizing life isn't about you alone. There's somebody else. It's not what time do you want to get up? It's not, you know, what, what are you going to have for dinner? There's, there's two people involved. Then you have a kid. And it's, you realize it's even less about you. And you have two kids, and it's just mm-hmm. lights out. Well, and I have a kid with special needs, too. So oh, like, that's like a even, whole other yeah. level yeah, yeah, of yeah. being an advocate. Surprised you're even here right now. What are you doing? The Well, we have a live-in nanny, which is a really good deal. So oh, it gives me a lot of freedom. Good for you. Yeah, she's really great. Man. She's really great. Um, she's a family friend yeah. of my wife's family. My Whenever I say that I have a live-in nanny, and my wife's there, she's always like, she's very quick to the, well, she's a family friend. Like, we... We know, like, we're not sure. we're not those people who just gets a nanny. Like, we, yeah, 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 you know, yeah, we yeah. we knew sure. her and family. Yeah, like friend. the two full time partner but, lawyers. But you know, that. you know, she's also not doing this for free, so it's not like we're you know, for sure, not like we're taking advantage of her. But it's awesome that she lives there, so she's a part of your home. Mm-hmm. It's not like a swoop in and you know, you outsource parenting to somebody who doesn't even yeah. live there. But you guys are, she's a part of your, or he, she, yeah, I she, suppose, she, a part of your integrated family unit. You yeah, know? it's a big deal. Yeah, I think that is a. I think that makes a big difference. She's a, my wife's a psychologist, so she is all about the the advocacy, and she uh-huh. understands. Like if, if if I was a if I had special needs, I I would wouldn't be able to ask for better parents than a psychologist and a 
and a youth pastor tattoo. Oh my gosh, dude! And I feel like that's a good so deal. True. Yeah. So I don't know. I think with a live-in nanny. Yeah, with a live exactly with a live-in <laughs> nanny. That's exactly right. <laughs> it's like it's the one, two, three punch. So um, you mentioned historic agency in Arizona. How often do you go out there? So, um, so do you? Should I give you kind of the trajectory of my? the thumbnail of my career. Yeah, sure. Just to kind of connect dots. Yeah. So 20, uh, about four years in full-time church work, started in worship arts, creative arts. Um, Did you do the singing? Yeah, I was a worship leader. Really? But I wasn't that good. Like, I mean, I, I was talented enough to have the job, but I was much more of a producer, leader, developer of other artists. So every time I was in that role, even when I had little to no power authority i was always building stuff underneath me that was way bigger making an impact being invited to meetings um so i was kind of like an executive level leader from the very beginning i just didn't know what that meant i just that's how i thought i was always interested in the bigger picture i was the only worship leader not writing songs i was listening to books by jack welch and jim collins and patrick lencioni right Mm -hmm. most worship leaders or artists don't do that so eventually right over about 15 years my career kind of took me more in the direction of leadership executive leadership which brought me into my last full-time staff role at the rock in san diego where I kind of had a pretty big team um, of marketing, communications, Sunday production, which is worship and um, all the arts associated with that. And then also had college, post-college. So I had uh, Mingo, who we both know, Mm -hmm. and a few other people I'm sure we, we would hold in common. But the uh, for me the the fusion of um, creative with strategy with real missional ministry as Mingo was doing it through college post college it, it was an incredible fusion. Uh, my time at the Rock was this like boot camp for my career today. About seven years ago, left The Rock to go into full-time kind of coaching, consulting. Did that through a few different organizations, but ultimately that led to starting Historic Agency, which is a full-service kind of brand, creative, digital solutions agency, primarily working with churches, but we also do uh, nonprofits of all different stripes and um, and then some for-profit corporate stuff. So we work with, we've done a couple of restaurants, we've done work with law firms, Ooh. And, yeah, all sorts of other stuff. That's really cool. Yeah, it's amazing. And for me, I think brand, that, that word brand has been the most important idea or concept that has helped me make sense of my career. I I think from day one, I've been a brand guy. I just thought at the time, early in my career, brand was a logo. And as I've evolved and grown and started this agency, it's been hinged on this idea that really brand is the sum total of everything you do. Brand is your culture, it's your product or service, it's your experience, how you feel, and your identity. So, um, you know, that for me is, and still, not only does it make sense of my career path and where I am today, it's still the thing that's the most exciting when I think about the future. How do we develop services that help faith-based nonprofits think more strategically about their brand um, so that everything's aligned um, from health to product, product development to all the marketing and identity and stuff that goes with that. Um, so that's where I spend my time today. Um, I'd say 50% of my time is working with churches uh, in the area of health and alignment and strategy. The other 50% is more brand strategy for nonprofits. You know, do you, and do you say you work with companies that are not involved yeah, in the church? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I, you know, we have found the same process and methodology, the stuff that we build cuts across the board. I mean, our philosophy and our tools and our paradigms are not uh, ex- are not at all different for faith-based. I think the outcome is obviously very different, Yeah. but we have the same fundamental conviction around what brand is, and, th- and that framework has helped restaurants be developed and conceptualized and even menu menus be planned all the way to churches and uh, faith-based nonprofits. You know, we're working with a huge financial institution who's doing a massive pivot away from brick and mortar to um, a fintech, a financial technology. Um, Yeah. Super, super fun. Super exciting. You know, when you decided to go out on your own to start this. Yeah. 
Like what was what was the process of, of making that decision? I'm always interested by that. Yeah, it's funny because when I left The Rock and I thought, okay, I'm going to do this full time coaching consulting thing. And by the way, I only did that because I had a gainfully employed spouse. There's no way I would yeah. have taken that step, right? Yeah, I, I mean, know all about. Praise that. the Lord for that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, people. You know, one time when I was, uh, one time when I, after I left Sandals, which is a uh, for those who don't know, a church that I worked at in Riverside, and after I left there. Um, you know, the I had a, there's people who reached out about jobs. I sent because I said I think I said online like, hey, I'm I'm gonna be I'm actively you looking did. for a job. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It was a very heartfelt post. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a real. The there comes a moment, and the, the, I give a lot of credit to Sandals for that because you know one they you know gave the thumbs up for that. The you know a lot of organizations wouldn't they have people sign non disclosures oh, and yeah. no one ever oh, knows. Gosh, for sure. But working in youth ministry, if you can't be honest about why you left a church especially if it's sudden, everybody, everybody will, even if they don't say it, will always think, yeah. well, it had to have been something moral. Had in, a, been. in a vacuum of proactive communication, everybody assumes the worst. Yeah. Everybody writes a script that's way more drama than it should be. Yeah. So I uh, just put it out there, and a lot of people reached out, super nice people. You know, hey, would you be in, you know interested in this opportunity or that opportunity or this? You know, the, but it was all like ch- you know church jobs in Texas or Florida or I got one from uh, from England that I was like kind of like, and they were really active. Wow. They, were, they were like, hey, well, and I was like, I don't think you know <laughs> me and my wife are moving to England, <laughs> and they're like, no, honestly, we listen to the podcast, um, Control Chaos, and like we'll we'll fly you and your wife out. We just, we just want to meet with you. Just give us the chance to share with you what we're doing. And I was like, man, going to England, all expense paid might be pretty good. But we just knew we weren't going to move to England. And good for you. We took like a day to pray about it, and like, which like, you know, it'd be it'd be yeah. really wrong to do that. But one guy in particular, I told him, hey, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not interested in moving to Texas or whatever. And he's like, he's like, what's the deal? He's like, I thought you needed a job. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, whoa, this conversation just changed. Like, well, yeah, I do, you know, I do need, I am looking. He's like, well, you know, I have an opportunity for you. Like, why, like, why aren't you interested? I'm like, well. I don't have to just jump in any opportunity because my wife, you know, she really makes all the money in the house. I'm a, you know, don't, let's not forget here. I'm a youth pastor. She's a psychologist. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I don't and need if to. If you live in California, you, you got to have something else going on. Yeah, exactly. So the, it, but it was really, really funny when I, when I say to people like, Oh, well, how are you doing? Like, how are you, how are you surviving? Um, and I'm like, well, you know, my wife, you know, a lot of people don't know, but she's kind of always, you know, made it happen. <laughs> so, dude, I, which I, I just love. I completely understand that. Yeah. So my my dogs just ran in here, and I'm going to see if I can get my buddy who's here to, to get them out of here. Did you have both these dogs since they were puppies? Yes. Uh, the Vizsla there, who they're both needy, and they're both liquors, and they're both unbelievably pathetic looking right now. Sounds like my prom date from high school. <laughs> Uh, I just don't even want to want to go. I mean, any everything you said that. describes that. I yeah. mean, she, but she's a wonderful gal now. I think she's she's married with kids now. She's fine. Yeah. So yeah, we've had them both since puppies. They're they're great dogs, um, but they're both a little schizophrenic and they're both a little uh, high energy and needy. So I've been wanting to get a dog. I just haven't got one. Uh, if you do, don't get a Vizsla. They're fantastic if you're high exercise, high energy people. But there's nothing about them that's chill. They're I'm not. A live wire. They're I'm live high wire. energy, but I'm not exercise. People. Yeah, yeah, you, so. that's that's golden doodle territory, right really? there, dude. Yeah, that's what was, our other one is. I was thinking like a Rottweiler. I heard they're great with kids, Rottweilers. I mean, okay, I have no experience with the, that, that. That well, dog. everyone thinks a Rottweilers is like the junkyard dog. Yeah, exactly. For like movies and stuff, but like the reality is, like they're actually really nice dogs. Apparently, I've heard that about pit bulls too. Yeah, it's true. It's pit bulls get a really bad rap. They're just so muscular, and it's easy to turn them. They have that lockjaw. Yeah, it's easy to turn them bad. Yeah, but if if you get you know, raise a pit bull like like a normal person would to just be a great loyal family dog, that's exactly who you want with your kid, like Good an point. awesome loyal pit bull who Fair loves point. my kid and will protect my kid. Yeah, that's, <laughs> give me uh, give me three of those security. Seriously, yeah, that's what you want. Okay, all that's right, what you want. I'll re- I'll rethink the next dog purchase. Yeah, well, I'll let you know how it goes. I could be totally wrong. They could turn on me, so who knows? Okay, so gainfully employed spouse. Mm-hmm. allowed me to take risks and do things to this day. It still does that. I never, I never would have done. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I married up, you married up. Yep. Big time. I can already tell. Yeah. But, uh, a million percent. You know, that, uh, option is, has been unbelievably helpful because, 
Uh, it's given me permission to, to, to innovate, think about things, not be, not make every decision in a conservative way that looks at the financial stability of our family home um, as the only thing that matters. So, uh, but that, uh, you asked the question about journey. So when I left The Rock, um, it was really to begin building my own brand. Uh, but there were a few other organizations, Clark AVL, a great audio video lighting company out of Atlanta. They wanted to use me for some client solution stuff that went beyond gear. And then Slingshot Group, great. Yep. We know the guys yep. at Slingshot, Stan huge and fans. Peter Miller. Love those guys. They wanted to work with me to build some divisions that didn't exist at the time around tech arts and communications. So I was like, man, I love this stuff. I'm a starter. I'm a, I'm a builder. Mm -hmm. yep. I didn't realize how entrepreneurial I was until I stepped into this space. Mm -hmm. And that went great. And then eventually my own shingle kind of became more significant than what Clark was doing. So I started to do what I did and then do some Clark stuff as helpful. And then uh, Slingshot eventually built these divisions, handed them off to other people, and then stepped out of the Slingshot staffing deal. Historic Agency's first client was Slingshot. Their rebrand with the logo change, and yeah. that was all that was all that team. I built a team to do that, and eventually we went, wow, this is incredible. Let's let's bootstrap this thing and see 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 what happens. And you know, four years later, we've got 10, 11 now staff and a little office in Gilbert, Arizona, and um, doing tons of cool stuff. Um, wow. But, you know, my, my journey has, now, you know, I remember when I first started on my own, I thought, okay, I'm going to give myself 12 months, like one year of just kind of doing lots of different stuff. And I'll just, in one year, I'll figure it out. I'll have a pathway. I'll know what success looks like and I'll walk it. Yeah. Right? What a joke. I mean, anybody who's been doing this long enough, you know, that's crazy. I feel that, like I say that to myself every year, every year I'm like, I'm going to give myself one year to just kind of figure out what the next year looks like. And because yeah. every year it's different. My life's been like this Venn diagram perpetually shifting. It's like in the beginning, it's Slingshot and Clark and Ted. And then it's CDF Capital and Slingshot and Historic. And then it's Slingshot's gone, but it's Historic, but we're working with with Slingshot. But so, And I think more and more what I'm realizing is because Historic Agency is working, I think in the life of any entrepreneur, Unless they want to stay Peter Pan forever and just sprinkle pixie dust on things and start things and then fly over and do something else. At some point, if you do that, you have to become a silent partner in the things you start. Because if you stay elbow deep, but you're not really there, the organization you've built doesn't know what to do with you. Yeah. And I think I'm experiencing that a little bit with, you know, the two organizations that I've been pretty instrumental in building from the dust up, one called Leadership Capital. That's a part of CDF Capital, this kind of financial institution that wanted to diversify services and historic agency. And I think in 2020, I'm going to have to lean harder into historic agency and really begin to own my ownership, my role, my presence and build tools and just be more all in there. So after the after slingshot, that's when you kind of looked and said, "Oh, this is this is a real. We should we should make this a business. This should be like a real yeah. It was a real thing. I, mean, I was working for slingshot and I was building a comm division. And obviously, I looked at the slingshot brand and was like, guys, I mean, really, we have a lot of great stuff in our brand, but but the, the identity visually is not right for the next five years. Now is the time to get it right, especially if you want to move into marketing and communications. Mm -hmm. They agreed and they said, you you know what, you figure it out. So guys, I had supervised at the Rock who to this day are some of my closest friends and some of the most amazing people in ministry I know, Anthony Miller at Saddleback, Minga Palacios, yep. Chris Lupe, uh, Mark Milan. Um, there's just a ton of people who, whose names I'm not saying and are probably upset right now. But they, so I brought Anthony Miller and Mark Miller, who's my business partner in Historic, and then a designer named Jeremy Wagner. And we all kind of came together and did the slingshot thing, and it worked. And we just bootstrapped Historic and said, you know what, let's start this thing, Historic Agency, kind of a cool Americana brand. You know, mm -hmm. his his history, his story, Historic Lion. That's all good. Yeah, right. Um, and, it, and, it, and it's just, it's worked. Um, and it's worked to the point where I now, as this kind of chronic entrepreneur, starter, developer, am having to really wrestle with what does it mean to now mature into adolescence as an entrepreneur and actually see this thing to its next season. It's next. It doesn't mean I'll stop, I think, developing, but it will be developing under 
the historic shingle. It'll be developing tools and services and new ways of doing things, but not starting new companies. Yeah. You, when you were at The Rock, if someone came to you and said, hey, I think you're going to be an entrepreneur one day, just starting stuff, would you have believed them or would you have been like, you're crazy? I'm so gonna be I had forever. tons of people in my life. I'd say tons. I had many friends who were saying, "You're, you know what? You're a, you're an entrepreneur. You're a sales guy. You're a biz dev guy. You're, you're really good at this side of the equation." And I always felt like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." But I'm a church guy, right? Like yeah. for the last 25 years, all I've known is 52 Sundays a year, right? The, yep. the, and that tyranny, especially for somebody with extreme ADD like I have, that's actually a very helpful tyranny because it keeps a constant fire right in front of your face to deal with. I mean, think about it. In church, you have 52 Sundays a year. You have no time off. Christmas and I mean, you can take time off, but it doesn't mean the thing stops. Yeah. yeah. Christmas and Easter are extra work. Probably Thanksgiving too, because everybody wants the, I don't know, the pie night or whatever yeah. it is. And then you've got all these extra things that you're doing. It's a grind. And I found a almost an addiction to that grind. And when it stopped and I actually went out on my own, it was really hard to focus and figure out how to manage my time and and set goals. Because I had spent 25 years just kind of living Sunday to Sunday to Sunday, literally. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I uh, lived that of like t- ten years, not not uh-huh. twenty years, twenty five years. But uh, but I remember that first couple weeks not being in the church, which at this point is you know still seven months ago. <clears throat> it was the weirdest feeling, not thinking, oh well, this is when I start thinking about camp or small groups or the launch of this or yeah. okay, I'm I'm eleven months out from this, I need to do X Y Z or I'm four months out from the launch of the school year, I need to do X, Y, to not have to do any of those things and then figure out what I was doing and how to structure that was weird. Yeah. It was yeah. really strange. Man, I, I mean, I, I totally get it. And, you know, you when you're in it, you don't realize what you're in. It just becomes normal. This is just the water in the tank. Yeah. And uh, I, um, I'll never forget the feeling the first Saturday I didn't have a Sunday thing that I was responsible for. And it was like like a 30,000 pound gorilla crawled off my back. It was an, an incredible feeling for the first two months. Then I started to realize I have no skill <laughs> at being proactive with my time and actually managing towards something. And I need an assistant. Good Lord, I am a mess. Yeah. I was, I was a starter, but the idea, and I'm sure all the people <laughs> historic who are hearing this are going, mm-hmm, hot mess. Yeah, that's good. That's funny though, because it means that they know you. Oh, and that you're totally. not a, yeah, you're not yeah, some fake no. dude trying to be something you're not. You know what? Listen, uh, I remember there were people at Historic who once would like they felt comfortable would start saying to Mark and me and kind of uh, as owners, "Hey, you kind of suck at this. You need to can you not do this because it's pissing me off?" And I remember thinking, "This is this is weird. Like this is I guess what it means to grow something. You have people who tell you what you suck at." Yeah, but that is health, right? I mean, I think that's frankly healthy for any for any senior leader. I mean, well, because if they didn't care, they would just well, they would that's just right. say they would just let you do whatever you want. It's what you or, want as an owner. You want employees who are so invested in the company that they'll actually hold you accountable. And man, who could? I mean, it's fantastic. It's funny because so much of my career has never really been about leadership or leadership development. I've never fancied myself as a leadership guy, um, and yet. When you work with churches long enough and you work with volunteer leadership and you come in and you help organizations think more strategically and deal with their barriers, and most of the time the barriers are internal, you end up almost becoming a bit of a pseudo leadership coach. Like I never set out to do leadership coaching. It's probably 25% of where I spend my time is helping leaders of organizations not be a barrier whether it's through them thinking more clearly about current reality or about their own influence or lack of, whether it's about health or it's about alignment. Um, So much now of what I do is spending time with a leader or leaders in order to let the strategic planning they're doing or the vision clarity they're doing or the brand work they're doing actually happen. You know what I'm saying? Like if, if you have a senior leader who has a ton of power and influence 
and doesn't realize the bottleneck or barrier that they're being to the organization, uh, the best strategic plan in the world, right? The best vision statement, the best brand strategy will fail because that senior leader will be the bottleneck, will be the pinch point, will kill the culture. Will, I mean, frankly, I think Mars Hill is a great example of that. I mean, Mars Hill, from a brand standpoint, had everything going for it. It oh, had yeah. the best identity on the block. It mm -hmm. had the best. So when you think about brand through the four dimensions that we do, right? Culture, service, experience, identity. It had identity for days. Killer identity, great design work. Jesse, one of their designers, is one of the best. It had a great experience. Very intentional for men. Very tailored from a guest standpoint to reach men, but very intentional. It had an incredible product mark his messages with a you know what you think about him doesn't matter the quality of his preaching teaching and the downloads across the globe were through the roof yeah but the culture something was off something hit a an accelerated tipping point thanks to social media and this brand that had on a scale of one to ten eight to ten quality of identity product experience was out of business in six months because the culture just it hit a tipping point of negativity fueled by social media and man it was lights out so fast yeah i remember that so i remember that yeah that was, so it was shocking it was super shocking i mean and, and you know no great brand that i'm aware of has ever failed because of its identity right no great brand has ever gone out of business because their logo sucked no it's the opposite we work with great brands all the time that have crap logo most of the time, failure that's that accelerated is because of a culture break. Look at what happened with uh, Gold, uh, Hollywood, right? The, the, the Me Too movement, the, mm -hmm. right? It's all about culture. It's about leaders. It's about self-awareness. It's about communication. It's about, yeah. So I'm spending, and I'm, I'm loving it, frankly. I'm spending, I mean, it's been great because the brand conversation has opened the door to culture in a way that I'm finding really rewarding because it gives me an opportunity to talk about leadership, self-awareness, healthy teams. Do you feel like as a consultant, you're almost able to say the things that their staff has said or have wanted to say, they just haven't listened to it? Like, do you feel yeah. like you have like an extra like, like Superman cape of being able to just kind of lay out the truth? Oh, that's a great illustration. It's funny because I think as a consultant, you come in like Superman, but what the reality really is, right, about 80% of your muscles are actually what other people have said. <laughs> you know, you're, <laughs> you know, I mean, maybe not 80%, but at least 50% of the time, my job as a consultant is to uh, identify what others have been saying, but validate it, legitimize it, or or push back against it. But you're you're coming in to make sense of uh, opposing opinions or voices or things, and they just don't know quite who to listen to. The other half of the time, you're helping them navigate stuff or think about stuff they've never thought about. You really are the outside eyes going, have you considered this actually sucks? Whatever it is, but you know. Have you ever gotten like huge pushback from someone after saying it like that? And they're like, no, no, you just don't get it. Like that, we've been doing this yeah. for 25 years and everyone loves it. Like you're just, you know, you're crazy. Yeah, it happens. But the benefit of being a consultant, especially in this church nonprofit space, is once they get to a point of calling you in, there's a, enough pain that they really are willing to listen. In rare cases, you can have a senior leadership team or senior leader who are so um, unable to hear critical feedback or deal with themselves that they will they will shut you down or get rid of you if you're in danger of exposing them. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen a lot, but it has happened to me a couple of times. I really, that's that's a crappy situation. Nobody wants to work with that guy. I mean, that's like that sounds yeah. terrible. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I yeah. I tell you, the church is a tough organization to lead well because of the pace, the volunteer dynamic, and I think the other thing I'm realizing. No offense to to pastors, but you know. Senior pastors are some of the most self-deluded leaders on the face of the earth. They don't want to be, but they have this constituency of people that come every week. And most of the time, we as pastors don't know why they're showing up. We think it's because of us, or we, or we judge it based on the conversations we had on the patio which with two families or with five people or social media. But we never really—I mean, how many churches actually have any type of data on how they're doing? 
very right? few. I mean, Hilton, every time I stay at a Hilton, good good Lord. I mean, a- any Hilton property, I get a survey. Hyatt, I get a survey, right? I mean, the surveying, customer research, it's a multi-billion dollar industry because big brands want to know if their thing's working. They want data. You know, it's so funny you say that because I completely agree. The churches are terrible at that. And I don't know if we necessarily should make decisions, every decision based on data, but most of the time we operate fairly blind to what people actually think. So I started doing surveys the last church I worked at Sandals, and they thought, you know, some people were like, well, why are we, why are we doing, like, why are we surveying people? And I'm like, well, you know, I think we should get a, I'm very into like the, um, you know, like, let's get tr- facts, not just like lead with emotion. Like someone says like, hey, how do you think things are going with parents? Like, oh, I think it's going pretty good. Like okay, well, great. <laughs> that sounds that's really good to hear. Versus being able to like look at like well, this is what parents think. And so we did this survey, and we asked about you know how would you rate communication from the youth ministry, and it was from one to five, and across you know nine campuses at the time, and we got like uh, once you you know did the average, it's like one point seven out of five, and people were shocked when they saw that like I have great relationships with parents, like they I know a yeah. lot of their names, they like right. me. And uh, like this is you know this can't be right, and I'm like, no, no, it is, it is right. If anything, it's probably worse because when it comes to churches, people don't want to be mean. Yeah, they like they, there's a bias towards being kind. You know the the you can get someone to show up at your church, but you know though they'll stop showing up just as quickly if these things that are really obvious and they won't tell you. No. I mean, I think when I work with churches in the guest experience space, you know, one of the things I think they often miss is that the guest journey is a series of little decisions, little experiences that are either working in the, and moving them in the right direction, building trust and confidence or not. And if they're not, nobody is, is experiencing it in a way where they're logging all the little trust betrayals or cracks or problems. They just kind of get to the end of the thing and go, eh. Or they get to the next Sunday and they're like, I don't know about that. Uh, you know, they don't know why. They just they make a decision that's informed by a series of little things along the way. We have to pay attention to those little things, to that journey, or we're working against ourselves. You know, do you find it easier to work with churches or work with just uh, companies, just, you know, CEO guys, at some for-profit, you know, whatever company that just, yeah. they just want to get it figured out because they want more customers? It's a great question. It's a hard question too, because I, because I feel like I'm almost putting you on the spot because I know a lot of your, no, your clients, you work with a lot of churches, so I don't want to I, No, I was, people, I mean, I, I, t- I tend to be too direct in my... So do I. Can, so do I. Candor and feedback. Listen, I, uh, I, I mean, uh, this might sound two-faced. I love working with churches and pastors because I know the beast. I feel uniquely called and equipped to help that world, followed by um, evangelical nonprofits, followed by nonprofits in general, because most nonprofits have the same problem, which is um, we don't know what we measure, we don't know what success looks like, and therefore we don't know how to actually build a culture that is meaningful and helpful. The opposite is true for, for, for businesses, which is why it's super fun and refreshing. When you work with a business or a large faith-based bank, for instance, yeah. okay, they know, like we're working with a bank right now at a Houston South Side. They or actually out of Tyler, but it's like, might as well be Houston. Yeah. They, they're a bank. They know what they measure. They know what percentage comes from this, from that. They know how much deposits they need to have in order to sustain the, you know, the outflow. Of, I mean, they have numbers. They have metrics. They have data. They have a scorecard. They have people who know their job based on that. And they have a culture. It's not perfect, but the culture is not unclear. It might not be healthy, but it's not unclear. And we talk about in our brand work, culture is not just health, it's clarity. Because you can have the most healthy people who love each other, but if none of them know why they do what they do or what matters, at some point that will erode health. Hmm. You can have an unbelievably clear organization, but if nobody trusts each other or enjoys the job or feels like it's a safe place to work, that's a problem. So clarity and health are, for us, the two pillars of culture. And... I think most churches and nonprofits I work with have health. They love each other. There's a sense of alignment with the mission. They're, they're doing it for reasons beyond the paycheck. They're just super frustrated for a lack of clarity. 
most of the other organizations I work with have great clarity. They're working on health. How can we actually take wellness seriously? Care about people, not just their their product, et cetera, et cetera. So it's I prefer to work with churches and I willingly accept those problems. But it's refreshing to get to work with leaders and organizations that have opposite problems. Yeah. It's just so interesting because then it really makes it forces you to be uh, an expert at both and both reinforces the other. I mean, being really good at working yeah. with churches helps you work with nonprofits, you know, but, and it's, vice versa. It's so true with our design work, too. You know, we have a great design team, and from web to, to print to just logo design identity, you know, when, when, when we do restaurants, when we do things beyond churches, it makes us better at serving because, frankly, more and more the barrier between what faith-based ministries, parachurch or church, are trying to do and the world they serve, that gap needs to shrink. And I think we've spent the last 40 years using the word Christian as some sort of adjective to modify art or design or plumbing or banking or... It was never meant yeah. to be an adjective, right? <laughs> so I think in many ways we're seeing in this next missional ministry future in America, the idea of Christian as an adjective isn't going to help anybody do anything, you know, unless you're really appealing to just a Christian market, which is a shrinking market in most of America. Yeah. So to a certain extent as an agency, as a solutions provider, strategy, vision, I want to see services that work across the board be what the church embraces because it helps narrow the gap it helps them you know i'm working i worked with a church and i'm working with a church in seattle a university of presbyterian church one of my favorite clients to date and at the very beginning it was really tough trying to get the elders to understand why so much change was necessary and i remember i stepped back and i said okay so they're in seattle so i said at this elder meeting is seattle 15 years ago different than Seattle today. And they just were like, oh my gosh, this and this and this and this and this. Is, is University of Presbyterian Church from 15 years ago different than it is today? Well, I mean, we, you know, sing different songs. We, I mean, the short answer was no, right? So you're on mission for Seattle. You want to see Seattle the way Jesus does, but you've done little to nothing to bridge the gap that's just been growing and growing and growing between you and this mission field. Wow. That would, I could imagine that would be a hard thing for them to... Well, it was, it was what needed to be said at the time. There yeah. are times where, as a consultant, you have to explode a little dynamite. Yeah. And that was one Did of those Did it kick it into gear? I, mean, is there I a... think it opened eyes. I think, I think they realized, oh, that's right. We're actually hiring you. We're paying you to be that guy that helps us see those things and do those things. And we can't keep defending why we haven't changed. We have to, we have to begin embracing why we need to change. What's been your toughest, without well, giving the name, you know, be as general as you want, <laughs> but what's been like your toughest, you know, uh, consulting gig? Like, I just, I, I just like, I imagine uh, you go in for a consulting gig and the, the guy in charge, the CEO, the pastor, whatever, is like, hey, Ed, you t Ted, I'm so glad you're here. You know, the, you know, no one understands. You're going to help, you're going to help me help all of them understand that I'm, that I'm right and the direction we need to go is, r that I'm saying is right. And that being like a terrible, like, situation. Like, I would, I'd imagine that'd be a terrible place to start with. Wow. Consulting. You know, it's it's a, it's a great question, and it's one I really haven't thought about enough. Um, I think uh, you know, um, there are so many ways to look at it. One would be what has been the hardest personally. What has been maybe the most difficult but most rewarding. Another way to look at it would be who's the client you worked with, and actually, your none of your advice seems to be helping. <laughs> I'll start with there. I'll be, I'll be a little self deprecating. Please, I'm working. I'm working with this client, a small church in La Jolla. And they've gotten smaller since working with me. <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> Needles moving in the right direction. But, you know, they, they didn't work with me for growth. They started work, working with me to get healthy. It was all about health. And sometimes health um, requires a season of shrinking, right? Sometimes getting the soil right doesn't yield above-ground growth at the pace at which you'd like it to, right? Yeah. Above-ground growth has its own trajectory and timeline. Mm -hmm. What you have to be responsible for is the health of the soil, so I'm helping this church get healthy, and the amount of sideways energy because of a dysfunctional board has been unbelievably draining. The, this board has not known how to truly come alongside leadership 
and the leadership have not known how to appropriately push and lead the board. And that combination has been unbelievably drama creating sideways energy. And because it's in La Jolla, you can imagine the type of board member, super smart, super successful, mm -hmm. take their opinions very seriously. So trying to help this dynamic has been unbelievably hard, challenging, and the amount of sideways energy that just continues to suck resource and stamina away from doing things that are proactive. That's been hard. That's been really hard. Love the people, love the church, still work with them to this day. But man, it has been difficult to be a part of that situation. You know, the, when you describe that type of person, I imagine well, the people, I, I, yeah, sy people, systems, systems. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that who are probably successful in whatever the systems or the things they're creating in their like day jobs. And they think it translates to the church. Oh man. Which I mean, drives me started. Yeah. I mean, that drives me bananas. I, I mean, uh, you know, the role of a church board member or an elder, depending on your lens or theology yeah. or denomination, it is not one of middle management. So most elders are, for the most part, mid to senior level middle managers, right? Very few times you get the CEO on the board, and very few times do you get the IT director. You know, you usually get somebody who spends their life as kind of a finder, keeper, maintainer, manager. Yeah. And a lot of times, and, and they're great at it. They're really good. And again, they might be executive, high-level SVP. They might be doesn't matter, but that's typically the profile of a church board member. If you don't help them understand what it means to be an elder, to be a board member, they bring that middle management strategy approach way of thinking and leading to that role, and it creates chaos if it's a church larger than 300. Yeah. So I think a lot of the time... What I find is, oh, well, we have theology around what it means to be an elder. We've got governance. We've got all this high-level stuff, but nobody actually knows what it means month in, month out, week in, week out to actually lead as an elder. Like, what kind of meeting agenda should we have? What are the things we should and shouldn't be talking about? What does it mean when there's a conflict with a staff member? How involved do I get or not get? What You know what I mean? All yeah. of these dynamics— really creates so much drama and sideways energy in churches because there's a lack of clarity around what it means to function as a healthy elder or leader in the church. What's a, what's an example of of when when you when you go in and you just know from the very beginning this is going to be a tough one. <laughs> we can talk about the good ones, right? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get, no, we'll, we're going we're going to get to the success stories. Oh, fantastic. Trust me, trust me. So for me the telltale sign is when the senior leader or leaders, maybe it's chairman of the board, maybe it's executive pastor with a lot of power, or maybe it's senior pastor, there is a low EQ or self-awareness. There's a barrier in their ability to hear or see, or oh, maybe there's a barrier in their ability to see, understand, and therefore hear the challenge or the issues that they're bringing to, to keep the culture broken. Um, when when you read that early in a in an engagement, it, you pretty much know as a consultant, I have two choices. I can stick with it and help people manage this reality, or I can bail. Oof, that's a tough one. Well, I don't want to spend somebody's money. Uh, it, let's, no, say, true, true. let's say over the course of a long engagement, the church works with me, and it's going to cost anywhere from ten to thirty grand, depending on what it is and how long it lasts. Yeah. I don't want to waste those kingdom dollars when ultimately I know I can't really help them or I'm going to make it worse or I'm just going to basically say, listen, I'm going to help you guys manage that 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 person because there's just problems there that you won't ever be fixed. Oh, gosh. That now, sometimes they do get fixed, right? I had one engagement in Texas and it was an unbelievable engagement because the senior pastor... So this is what typically happens with me. The scope of work starts as like strategy, vision clarity, organizational stuff. And you get in and within the first week after talking with people, you realize realize actually what this is, is crisis intervention, leadership therapy, and coaching on how to be healthy. Let's start there, and then we'll get to all the strategy and vision stuff, because that, nobody's going to be honest. You're not going to have a productive strategic session if, if everybody is dysfunctional and, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the scope of work is always different. It always ends up being, like I said earlier, it's like you don't set out to be a, a leadership coach, but you, you end up there. And it's 
in this case, this church in Dallas, man, this guy was a problem. And he kind of knew it. He received it. He rose to the occasion, and everything changed. Mm. Culture changed, which led to quality changes in their product and service, which led to experience changes, which led to them making identity changes because they could actually say, this sucks. Can we change this? I mean, culture... When, when healthy unlocks everything else. And that was the case here. And to this day, man, the guy is still challenging in some ways, but boy, he is, he owns it. People tell him the truth. Yeah. Great success story. Give, give us some more success stories, okay? Because so the, the, the thing, I, again, I always, I, I think everyone loves the show. I don't know if you've ever seen the show Bar Rescue. Oh, yeah, for right? sure. I love that Restaurant show. Rescue. Exactly, the whole thing. Ramsey, whatever yeah, they, and he, they go in, and there's, there's, you know, there's rats on the floor. Yeah, and, you know, yeah, There's yeah, always right. weird yeah, stuff. Yeah. And he comes in, and you're just, you're just like, ah, you're weird. Yeah, Shit, this you know, is stupid. Move this thing around. And I feel like it takes a lot longer in a church to do that. I mean, you know, that, and then you hear, like, the, the updates from some of these these bars or restaurants, and it's like, it's like ah, they didn't really stick there. But what right. are some of, like, the epic success story moments from historic some of the historic moments do you guys say it call call that historic moments whoa i feel like you should this, no this is a whole new no you guys you, you said we know honestly we've never thought about that Are you I'm, sure? I'm glad that you didn't go you know have you considered ted talks <laughs> no that would be that's Lame. like when someone says hey ever anyone ever call you Wee herman because my last name's herman uh which uh, they have when I was in middle school, and it's not funny. You're like, so, yes, I still have scar tissue. Yeah, exactly. No, and, no. Well, usually Jerk. I go the opposite. I'm like, no. I'm like, I never heard that before. They're like, really? I'm like, yeah. I've never been around a holes. And, oh. And then they, wow. then they're like, then they're, like, uh, they just don't know what to say. They're, then I laugh it off. I laugh. I always laugh it off because it, because it is funny. But that's my, that's my I way of seeing. You having a bit of a biting way about you. Yeah, you, I do. I have a very like a dry gift. bite. Yeah. Very it's dry upstate bite. New York, bro. It's no, what it happens really when is. you're born in winter. Yeah, if you can't if you can't hang, then oh, you'll you'll be into. And yeah, growing up in upstate New York, growing up in the winters, like you're hardened. Game of Thrones, bro. It, it really is. It looks. Just I'm like, like the ice guy. I've well, never I wasn't watched going Game of Thrones. I've, I've never watched Game of Thrones. I've, really? I watched the very last. Oh, I got totally addicted. I got. I watched totally the very addicted. last episode. I got addicted to that and Billions. Now Billions is great. I Max haven't. Cap for I the haven't win. been. Uh, I haven't seen recently. But the first two seasons I watched. Oh man. And then I didn't have keep watching. Anyone. Keep watching. Yeah, is it good? Yeah, I'm really into Amazon shows right now. Uh, like about the Amazon or what? No, no, uh, the Amazon. No. I know. I'm joking. Oh, that was a bad joke. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, yeah. no, that's good. It was a dry <laughs> so, humor joke. I'm trying. Uh, Jack Ryan. I've been watching Jack Ryan. Oh, I got to watch. I, there are so many. I used to never watch TV, and now it. You know, I think to the credit of what's happening in our kind of uh, content society uh, of. Pro proliferated content it's working for me i'm seeing i'm watching more television than i ever did when it was major network stuff yeah i agree i agree okay so what was your question huge success historic oh, moments oh, oh. historic from moments historic yeah, moment, which you totally can use, you can use thank you use that. licensing i don't know quarter, i mean quarter a month we'll figure it yeah quarter, quarter actually quarter like, that'd be great to be honest with you so but pay for my parking when i go down to Huntington beach and get tacos Oh, so good. Okay, uh, I think honestly, right now it's uh, it's 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 I'm, I'm coming towards the end of it. Still have a little bit of an engagement, but it is University Presbyterian Church in Seattle. Okay, um, it has been such. There are two. One was there. The other one was with an organization I work with, Leadership Capital through CDF Capital. Uh, that church in Manhattan Beach is called Journey of Faith. And the church in Seattle is University Presbyterian Church. Uh, you know what's interesting about both cases, uh, Justin? In both cases, it's the senior pastor that was, I think, ultimately responsible for the engagement being so successful, which goes back to my point. Senior leaders shape culture. They open the door or shut the door for health and growth and alignment and improvement in your brand. And so in both cases, senior pastors were unbelievable men, unbelievably different, not your typical Craig Grishel type of hardwiring, but just very much more cerebral or thoughtful or caring, more shepherding than they are leading type uh, lead, lead pastors. But both of them took leadership seriously. Both of them said, I need to do and be whatever it takes in this season. And they figured stuff out. They rose to the occasion and they were the tip of the spear for their churches addressing stuff. Why University Presbyterian Church was so successful? It was for me a great example of start with clarity, really assess what's happening, what's going on. They did a pretty robust survey. 
really good outside eyes assessment, really understand what's broken, what needs to happen. Then they walked through a, a process of getting clear and articulating their vision and their values in a way that was right. Their lead pastor had been essentially an interim pastor for eight years. I mean, the church had had this charismatic guy as their lead pastor, and he left, and they re- they replaced Earl with George, with no interim, and it was really, really rough. So George really had come in and has been essentially the interim pastor for about seven or eight years, and wow. he finally said, listen, either I lead or I need to figure out my calling. And the church said, you're our pastor, you need own, lean in. And this process let him do that, and they articulated a whole new kind of meta-narrative for their church that is so powerful, uses great language, really positions them to minister to Sa- Seattle and the University of Washington in a whole new way. Then we did strategic planning and alignment around that vision and around that articulation of mission and values. And now they're doing, they've made hires, one of my closest kind of mentoring relationships in my life is now their executive director of ministry. So I've got personal connections there. So that for me has just been an unbelievable story of success to walk with the church through that level of change and see it start to work. Now, are they growing? Yes, in terms of healthy soil. No, in terms of above ground growth, mm-hmm. meaning numbers. Yeah. And, but will they? I think so. And I think what growth looks like in a place as post-Christian and pluralistic as Seattle oh, yeah. is going to be very different than what it looks like even in suburban Orange County. Mm-hmm. What's, a, what's another one you'd point to and say, you know what, that was, that was really fun, that worked out, that people are happy after going through the process? I have my, I have my computer right here. I should pull up all my, pull up my client list and like look, look through it because... But it's a great question. Um, oh, yeah, this one. This one was great. I, I hope they would say it was great. So, um, oh, that one too. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you know, I've gotten to do some brand work with uh, the church Chris Lupe was a part of. Actually, no, I'm, I'm going to talk about this one. Early in my career, one of the very first organizations I got to work with was this merger between a Presbyterian church in Encinitas and um, a harbor church plant called Harbor Church that was using space at this other church. And essentially, both of them decided it was time to merge and come together and be one. Mm -hmm. And they did it under the banner of Redeemer, kind of like Redeemer New York, Presbyterian, kind of a sister church of Redeemer New York. So I got to walk with them early in my kind of consulting career through the process of merger, naming, brand development, visual identity, all of that stuff. And, um, And now today they're a church that's probably three and a half times their old size. Incredible preaching. Uh, It's Redeemer Presbyterian in San Diego. Um, Killer. Uh, I love their visual identity. I think it's spot on. Um, And now I'm engaging with them to do kind of work on organizational health and culture. Uh, But again, kind of under the auspice of design thinking, creative solutions, but doing it to really address issues of, hey, now that we're over a thousand people, how do we keep growing and not be bottlenecks? You know, a lot of times you have a staff or a lead pastor, they've never been in a church that has a thousand people, and now they have it. And the question becomes, do you know how to lead it? And most Mm -hmm. of a lot of times they don't. The systems, the structures, the leadership paradigms, all those things change. So getting to kind of come in and now speak some best practices and help them think about what it means to continue to grow and be healthy from the inside out, it's awesome. Has it always been just getting leads from current clients? Like how, how did you grow mm-hmm. the the whole thing when you get got started? You know, um, I've never been good at classic inbound outbound marketing. It, it's always been for me about loving the work that I do, being good enough to do it and hopefully get referrals. And, um, and I have gotten referrals and work from, you know, people that knew me at the rock, like Mickey Stonier and a lot of other leaders that I've kind of grown up with and known over the years. But, um, the primary driver for lead generation for me has been um, getting in the door because Slingshot's having me work with the church for staffing. 
And then I get to know that church. We have honest conversations because anytime you're hiring a high level staff person, you know, you're supposed to kind of figure out yeah. who you are, what you need. Or or I'm working on behalf of another brand, like, you know, Oxano is using me for something, or CDF Capital, or Clark, or whatever. But I'm being used in more of a niche way. But I get in the door, have meaningful conversations. I would say at least 30 to 40% of the time in my career, those conversations, those opportunities have blossomed into other opportunities that have either been with me or with Historic. Great example, I worked with The Crossing in um, St. Louis, great church, Greg Holder, incredible senior pastor, probably another success story. Greg Holder is one of my most favorite people, senior pastors, incredible dude. Um, Started as Slingshot, moved to working with me directly for some stuff, moved then to Historic Agency, and for a while they were like, I was working with them with a Slingshot hat on, a Historic Agency hat, and a Ted Vaughn hat. And it was weird, and there'd be all sorts of weird perception issues, but there was just a level of candor and honesty, and it made sense, and we did it, and it, it was a good season. That's um, awesome. Yeah, so I, I think that's the answer. I've never done marketing. It's never been one. It's just been um, somehow through God's grace, word of mouth, and um, opportunities because people open doors for me. That's so good. You know, what are you— thinking about right now you said you mentioned your your mm -hmm. add yeah is that a self-diagnosis or is that like a real like i i have adhd and it's like a superpower for me i love it uh, i probably need tips on how to make it a superpower because i tell i tend to look at it like it's a more of a weakness really yeah that's so interesting my uh, people will like say that to me and i i and for me, I just can't relate. Well, we need, we need, you need to coach. Like, it's probably this. a weakness when it comes to some areas. Yeah. But when it comes to. Do you take anything for it? Yeah, I do. My wife is, is pro me taking. Uh, Rhythm? I take Adderall. Adderall. Oh, I Adderall. took Ritalin when I was a kid. I take yeah. Adderall now. And I take it every day. And it helps focus me. But there'll be times where I like specifically go off of it so that I can like really like dream up stuff. Blue like, sky. Re <laughs> really think outside the box. And like it's for that reason. Like it's like, it feels like a superpower. Like I'm just not confined to uh, I love it. typical thinking. <clears throat> I can know, just like let loose. I, so this is what I this is this is this is um, what happens to me. Just we're on the the ADD topic. I uh, I have had people who are psychiatrists and professionals say you probably have this, but oh, okay. not. It is not anything that I've. But I, as I think about my past and my present, the way it plays out the most for me right now, why I don't feel like it's often a superpower is because um, I love the phone calls, the video calls, the facilitation. I think my, my superpower is my ability to facilitate a room, um, not, not speak to a room, but facilitate a room. I love that. I'll do that all day long and not be bored because it's relational. I'm a seven on the Enneagram. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's all about people. It's extroverted. Um, the minute that whatever facilitation or workshop or thing turns into a seven to 20 page deliverable, that's going to take six to eight hours of, of focused time to get done. And I will like, I'll avoid that monster as long as I can to the, <laughs> to the point where my body is manufacturing adrenaline, which helps you focus, which replaces what Adderall or Ritalin might do. Mm -hmm. So essentially, I'm kind of getting my own internal medication to, to get the focus necessary to do the deliverable. Yeah, I hear that. And I'm good at it. And once I do it, it tends to be a pretty good deliverable. It's usually longer than it needs to be. Yeah. But, um, but that, so that, that is a cycle that plays out a lot in my life that I got to figure out how to not. I, that, that, that is not sustainable. Well, it's probably longer because once you get into it, you start thinking oh, different yeah. angles but that's a great which point. that is not that is a typical a person a typical person will sit down for to do a five page thing and they'll finish up with a five page thing they'll actually trim stuff if they need uh, you to fit the five pages and i'm like oh i should say it this way oh we should add this oh we could do yeah. this we could do this. because this thing adds yeah. to this thing which so takes I'm a to this great thing. improver and pro and thinker and editor and changer and updater and yep. starter it's tough when it's like coming in on the back end now and seeing it through, driving it all the way to the, oh man, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I struggle with it. At with some point, historic is, gonna, is ticking more and more off of me 
because I, but you know, it's that that has been the greatest challenge of my career in the last seven years. Again, not having the tyranny of Sunday, which gives you a bit of a focus. It's like, you know, I know what I'm focusing on. It's this. Yeah. Um, and so the need to be proactive in that, man, it's been tough. It's been tough. Um, but what was the question that you asked earlier <laughs> about, uh, you know, what do you, what do you do to, you know, how, how do you, you know, work with that? How do you work with that as a tool? Which you kind of answered that. Well, yeah, I, I don't, I, I don't know. I wish I had more thoughtful of an answer about it, but I, yeah, I, I think I've lived with it and managed it. I don't know that I've, I've leveraged it as a strength. Well, you don't also don't use it as an excuse. You're not, it's not, it's not like you're sitting at home no. eating chips saying, oh, I can't really no. build anything, lead anything because I'm just so, I'm just so yeah. crazy. I just have so many ideas in my head. I really no. can't, can't really do any of them. And then you do nothing, which no. there, you know, that there's a category. But I love the client engagements. I mean, I think I've flown 225,000 miles this year um, to be with clients and to facilitate engagements. The, the work that, the, the this work is so relational and trust is so critical and most churches and nonprofits don't invest unless they're in great pain in this type of stuff. So it ends up being a very, they want, they'll pay extra to have you be present because it's, they want the high touch. Yeah. I can see that. See, I, I'm wired for people. So like I yeah. love being around. Them. You would want that. Yeah. I would want that. That aspect of it. I would love. Yeah. Um, and even when I was pastoring, like I loved that. But then you, I had an operations person to deal with, like the yeah, to, like get deep yeah. into the nitty gritty. But like, you know, I've gotten better at it along the way. We have that at Historic and the uh, the crew, man. It's unbelievable what they're able to do. Um, you know, I just didn't I didn't realize even at the Rock what an executive assistant would do until I had a great one named Courtney, and Courtney came into my office one day and said, "Would it be helpful if I told you how I could help you?" And I was like, "Man." Yeah, wow. thank you. Please do that. That's a really good deal. Yeah, if you send her my way. That sounds like a. That's how a, that's do you, kind of how do you navigate it now? Doing what you do with all of well, this. Well, I use. Uh, well, one, my wife's great. Okay, so she she stands in the gap. For do a you lot use of a that. tool like OmniFocus? I, I use uh, Asana oh. for everything. Okay, so when I when I'm you know putting together episodes, when I'm figuring out and kind of building a scope of work with a client, um, I'll use Asana for everything set nice deadlines um i look at it daily it's my to-do list so you have like a discipline around when you open yep. it engage it you're kind of ritualistic about it so that you well, i wouldn't i don't know if i'd say ritualistic as much as the when i know i just for, i move away from just oh i'll remember that or oh i'll just write that down here and everything goes into that that's like the smart the, the day asana crashes or gets sold and shut down yeah like that'll be a tough day for me sunset but w whenever it's uh I get a phone call from a client. Hey, could you, could we do this? Or great. Yeah. Let me make a note here. And Asana is where I'm making those notes. Or yeah. if I have a show idea, I'll just open up my, Hey, Suri, add a, add a, you know, Oh, just see, <laughs> see, see, she's always ready to help me. Um, I'll just have, you know, have a, add a show idea or yeah. a, Hey, you know, let, you know, remind me to reach out to this person. Yeah. You know, let, let's see if we can get, you know, this kind of this, you know, we let's get a heart surgeon on the podcast. That, that's pretty interesting. I wonder how that works. Um, remind me to, email some heart surgeons and so you know just you know stuff like that that it's like most people be like wait email heart why would you do that that's but awesome in my head yeah. it's like no this totally makes sense because i'm going to build this yeah build the show with, you know the in the deal so i just kind of keep everything there I and think, it works i think that probably is for me the the um the critical next step it's using omnifocus better omnifocus is a killer tool are you familiar yeah. with it no, i'm not it's um yeah, it's part of the whole get stuff done GSD um, kind of perspective on project management, task management. But yeah. um, I, I used it a long time ago, and it was actually very helpful. I think I've just drifted too far. I check that out. True confessions. No, seriously. I mean, yeah, but, 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 but it's a real thing. You know, it's a real yeah. thing. Oh, no, totally it is. You, you know, um, the, the thing, I don't know if this was a question you asked, but it just occurred to me that I've found probably the most um, joy in lately it has been not just doing the client work, but doing the client work with people that I trust and love and have gotten to kind of see grow in their own kind of career development. So again, my business partner, Mark, uh, this new person we recently hired named Tammy at Historic Agency, Anthony Miller and I have done lots of state of the church surveys, which is kind of a robust, all-encompassing state of the church type survey. Mm -hmm. um, and Anthony, again, is over at Saddleback uh, using 
Chris Lupa. I mean, just the, it's funny because when I left The Rock right after four and a half years or so, I remember I, it was a resume builder and I would talk about, oh, we did this, we did this, built a television program, we did this, rebrand, went multi-site, blah, blah, blah. And then, I don't know, within two or three years, most of that had unwound or wasn't happening as well. It wasn't anything worth pointing to. And what I realized, almost I was convicted about, was really the legacy from my time at The Rock wasn't all that stuff we did. It was the people. Yeah. It was Anthony and Chris and Mingo. And, you know, so today to get to do work and continue to partner with those. So this, as a matter of fact, this Friday, so Chris Lupe is coming into town and going to do some design sprint work with me on some website stuff. And then we're going to have kind of like a reunion gathering at my house Friday night with the old rock crew. Um, Anthony's coming out Man, and it's going to be super fun. That's great. Yeah. You're hearing, hearing that the, you know, that's a perfect spot to end and hearing you talk about the people and the relationship. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is maybe the most interesting thing because for everything you've been doing, everything you've built, all the, all the, the, that you would, the, the the joy you get from the people you do it with. You know, I think that's something that everyone should walk away from. Yeah, man. It um for me, I mean, again, I'm a seven on the Enneagram. I'm highly relational. The tools, the critical thinking, the getting to be right, that that's all that's all super fun. But I think at the end of the day, there's a there's a there's a ministering to people side of the equation that for me is everything. So yeah. I love it. Ted Thanks so much for making time Thank to you. be on the show. You're I hope awesome. This was helpful. I hope this somehow adds value to your next endeavor. It is. Well, this is an interesting conversation. You're you're an interesting guy, and this is hopefully Thanks, we'll have man. you on again sometime. I can't wait. Let's do it. Yeah.